So I'll ask you the first question I asked Brandon on his okay. episode. If I brought you a great real estate deal or a great business deal, which one would you rather do or which one gets you more excited? Oh, good question. By the way, Tanner, this thanks for having me. This oh, is yeah. awesome. It's great to have you. Um, excited to be on here. I've I've known Tanner for oh, I don't know, a Two little years? over a year. Yeah. yeah. And uh uh, he was part of a ULI mentorship group and yeah. differentiated himself from the very beginning. <laughs> so this guy's going places. I appreciate that. But uh, anyway, uh, a good business deal or a good real estate deal. Um, my kids, if they ever listen to this, which I doubt they ever will, they're going to say, there, there goes dad again. Yeah. Because I'm going to give you an answer that they hate. And it depends. It depends. Um. Uh, I love operating companies, mm -hmm. and uh, generally, if I've got a choice, I'm probably going to choose an operating company, um, uh, but they are trickier. There's a lot more dynamics. Um, you know, Typically, a real estate's not going to go to zero, where an operating company can go to zero. So, um, But I also love real estate. Real estate, to me, is... If, if you look at the public market equivalents, uh, operating companies are like your stocks yep. and real estate's like your bonds. Mm -hmm. And um, so the, the, it depends is what, I'm, what am I looking for? Am I looking for yield? Am I looking for growth? Um, typical operating company is going to give you growth. May not necessarily give you yield out of the gates as you're reinvesting dollars, but real estate um once it's up and running and stabilized, is going to give you that yield. So, so on that note, are you looking like when you're investing in the operating companies, it's strictly a growth play. You're like, I don't really care how much cash flow I make in year one through five. I'm looking for an exit in year seven. Is that how it works? Um, not necessarily. I mean, some it, it if you if you're looking for a pure growth play, you may go a little um, higher risk on some of your operating companies. You may go a little earlier stage. You may go. Uh, something that you may do something that is where you're investing all those earnings back in and you know you're going to have to invest all those earnings back in. Um, and, you know, that's pure growth. Some of the operating companies we've got involved in um, have yields. And I think that's why as a, investing for a family, we kind of look for a mix. We want to have something that yields, that gets cash back, but we would still love to have growth and you know, some capital gain opportunities. And so, um, uh, again, it probably yeah. it depends. <clears throat> so what about a, we'll say an operating company, what, what gets you excited? Like, when are you investing? Is it like, Hey, I just started this company and it's me and one other guy. Do you want in? Or is it like, you need to see some actual enterprise value before you're like, okay, I'm interested. Yeah. Um, for, for Blue Diamond Capital, how we operate, we typically are a little more conservative. Um, we haven't played a lot out on the VC end of things where you've got companies that are startups. We've done some. We haven't done real great at that. That's yeah. probably you, – you had mentioned or asked me about some of our losers. Some of our losers have been on the VC end. Yeah, and I – I feel like that's a common characteristic. Like, I don't know, I don't know if I know anybody who's like really good at real estate and also really good at venture. Cause yeah. I have a friend who works at a New York uh, venture capital firm. And the way that we approach deals is so different. Like, if yeah. you send me a real estate deal, I'm like, how certain am I that this is not going to go to zero? Like, yes. what is my initial yield? And like, that's pretty much it. His first question is like, can this become a billion dollar company? Right. And it's almost like you, it's almost like, I don't know if it's from birth or just, you just look at him completely differently. Um, <clears throat> I totally agree. I, I totally agree. I had met with a partner from a VC firm here in the Valley that everybody would know. And, and I was telling him kind of of our woes investing in, in VC. And he's like, every deal, it's gotta be a billion dollar deal. And I just, it's hard for me to wrap my mind. Cause right. I, like I look at these tech companies, I'm like, you're cool. I'll give you nine bucks a month, but do I think you should be worth, Ten billion dollars, like right, no. <laughs> right, but, right, right. I don't know. So it is definitely it's a different investment uh, philosophy, and you know, in any portfolio, there's room for some of it. But yeah. just as 
you know, as we've talked about it, you know, finding the right people to help you invest in those areas on the VC, you, you got to find the right people. In fact, probably of everything we do, people is probably one of the, the key elements. Okay. So let's talk, let's walk through kind of that statement here. So we'll say I bought NVIDIA in 1992 and now yes. I'm going to sell and I'm going to make a hundred million bucks. Yes. I want to start a family office. How do I do it? Um, it's a good question. It's a good question. Um, I would say one of the things you probably have to do is you probably have to sit back and say, um, what are my end goals? Um, so the family we started off with, um, Mark and Debbie, one of their goals was to give it all away and, and put it into a foundation, but at the same time, be very entrepreneurial and invest in other individuals and companies. So, so they, we identified that early on of, Hey, um, involved in our portfolio is an aspect of not just getting returns, but being entrepreneurial about it. And so I would say you, you, you need to step back and you need to say, okay, what do I want to do? How do I want to accomplish it? Do I want to, is this something I'm going to try and pass on to my family? Is this something that um, the goal is to end up giving it to charity? Is this something where I just want to yield and I want it to be the biggest number possible. Um, and so I would say you step back and you've, you've got to identify how you're going about it. And one of the things that I think people don't think about, because there's, it's, it's, you know, in my line of work, I've, I met a lot of successful people. You could say that. Yeah. <laughs> they don't, they, they, a, a piece of this or an aspect of this is what do, what do they want to do with the rest of their lives? And some of them are like we met with this uh, gentleman just this last week, and the guy is in his eighties. And his comment to me was, "I'm going to die at my desk." What a beast! Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I love that. Yeah, and he, you know, for, so for him, investing wasn't um, it wasn't it, laborious or anything. It was like passionate, right? Almost. Right. Yeah. It was it was part of who he was. Um, and then there's other people, um, and and I see this a lot of times. We call them G1, G2, Generation 1, G Generation yeah. 2, even go to Generation 3. G1 usually has different goals than G2 and G3. And sometimes G2 is saying, hey, I saw what the cost or the burden of wealth did to my family, and I want to approach this differently. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to die at my desk. I want to know my kids. Um, I want to make a difference in the world. And, um, and they aren't, they don't, the business doesn't define who they are. And so they look at wealth differently and they say, I want to define who I am. And I have this aspect of wealth that is part of my life, but it's not who I am. I feel like a lot of the time the generation one, like the founder, the hustler, the guy who will diet is desk yeah you know, they almost look sourly upon that like the second generation yeah like do you think it's even a good idea to just get your kid like gift them this huge thing of wealth or do you think that they need to go out and create their own thing like how do you think about that yeah it's a good question um it's something that i've you know i've been involved with uh mark and debbie for 20 years now and it's something i've and we've had other families that we're working with, and and they have different visions. And it's something I've grappled with kind of by myself. Um, I I don't have necessarily the wealth of the people I work with, but um, yeah, much more. Right? Well, I I have more than I ever thought <laughs> yeah, I would be blessed with. And and so I'm sitting there thinking, how does this wealth? What is my stewardship with this wealth? And um, and you know, with, with, with your kids, you want them, like, I want my kids to be able to, uh, define their lives, drive their lives and, and kind of reach their goals and wealth can help them get there. 
Um, but I have a son who he is almost like anti-wealth, meaning he has has kind of taken it upon himself to, to like I went car shopping with him and he bought the the cheapest thing on the lot, which I was like, great. You, you have a budget. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got to live within it. I, I love it. Um, but it's 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 almost like he is um, he's he's trying to define himself differently. And G two, G one sometimes looks at that as G two is entitled or they're lazy. And, Kids don't work these days. Right, yeah. right. And I'm sure my my grandparents said the same thing about our generation. Yeah. And and I'm sure the next generation will say it about the next generation. And I think, you know, life because of kind of the standard of living, everything gets a little bit easier mm -hmm. physically, but maybe not mentally or emotionally. Okay. <clears throat> um so we'll say you start that family office. Yes. And do you think that there's kind of a minimum? Because I see guys on LinkedIn who have maybe like a low single digit net worth who claim to be a family office. And really it's just them trying to raise money from other people. Yeah. Do you think there's kind of like to do a real family office with staff and that type of stuff? Do you think that there's a minimum for this? Like, does it have to be 50, hundred million or something? Um, I think there are economies of scale. I think you can be an investor at whatever level. Um, whether you're a true family office, family office definition is is really loose, and there's but you know there's a lot of ways you can look at it and view it. Um, we uh, we just had a liquidity event in one of our companies, and and one of the founders pulled off, you know, a a, a good eight figure number, mm -hmm. and he had been previously involved day in day out in the in the business he founded very in depth and and now he has spending all of his time kind of managing his wealth and and is he a family office uh not like blue diamond but yet he's an investor right he's a family who right. invests in stuff yeah. right right and 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 he's investing in he's investing in deals and and so um, I think what you get with the larger number is you get the ability to uh, bring on professionals that can help you in different aspects. Um, and, and I'll give you some examples. So, yes, the answer is you can be a, a family office at, I don't know, 25, 50 million, but how many different services and what you do, who knows? And a lot of times, to your point, these guys are just out raising funds i'm um, starting a family office it's just the webster family yes. it's just me and my dog so that's right yeah, that's right that's and you're gonna do amazing yeah, you're gonna have gonna amazing syndicate deals. a bunch of money it's gonna be great yeah um, so um but yeah i think the bigger family office the more you have in our management you can fold different things in and one example is um for mark and debbie where they wanted to give away incredible amounts um we basically started up a foundation we've got an executive director of the foundation and we've got a professional that is helping manage and run that as part of his job if we were half the size could we afford that professional yeah maybe maybe not mm -hmm. okay um we'll say for this example you sell it for 300 million bucks or something like yeah. plenty of money yeah and i I want to invest and I want to make big returns and I want to do cool stuff, but I don't really want to do it. I want to hire, you know, someone like you or someone like Brandon. How do you recommend someone incentivize them? Like, is it a super low base salary and then they get some of the promote or is it just a huge salary? Like, how do you think about that part of it? Yeah. Good question. Hard to find people like you too, by the way. So that's another yeah. question. Um, yeah. You know, you probably find guys like me on every street corner, but <laughs> um, finding guys like Bran and indeed very hard. And needle in a haystack. Um, uh, I have always, you know, I've always believed if you incent people where you win together, you lose together, um, you get better teamwork. 
I do think you have to get unique people that that are willing to uh, go in and and take that kind of risk. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Um, it, but uh, I had out of school. I went to work for a uh, EMY. And all my clients were public or private equity back. And my first job a- after that was with one of my clients, which was private equity back, and became part of a management team. And within a year, we did a transaction, and I got a piece of the pie. I got it was a sliver. I mean, it was it was nothing, but for me, it was super Huge. meaningful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and a, I also got visibility to what the the key principles um got paid and it was like for me it was an eye-opener yeah and it was really enticing i was like wow this is this is awesome and so uh when we sold phone directories and mark said hey um we're gonna be i'm gonna be very entrepreneurial come and join with me and i'm gonna give you a piece of the action that was i mean it was like a no-brainer it yeah. was i oh, man, let's do this i i imagine it'd be really hard to find someone of your caliber and your expertise without giving them some of the upside. You think that's the case? I think it is. I think it, I think it's really hard. And I will say that what we try to do with most of our operating companies, with most of the deals we do, we try to give the principals, we try, we want to make sure the principals have a piece of the action. If they are founders, you know, a lot of that's built in, but Mm -hmm. even beyond that, um, sometimes we've gone in and said, hey, we're going to give you additional profits units because we want you to win uh, when we win. That's awesome. And uh, so, yeah. And, you know, it's fun. It's fun being a part of this. Um, uh, a few years back, we were looking at Blue Diamond and how we structured it and everything. And for various reasons, we decided to, to look at a little bit of a different structure and and you know we were able to bring a couple of guys in on the ownership at Blue Diamond, mm. and seeing them have success when we've had success, and seeing them now investing their own funds and thinking like investors. I mean, we sit down at an investment table, and it's you know we go through an investment committee, and we're talking about deals, and it's like, okay, are you putting your money in? Are you putting your money in? <laughs> yeah. And as an employee, somebody would be like. Yeah, sounds good. I'm not worried about the risk. Sounds good. You're gonna I'll love still it. be employed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but when they start making their own investment decisions, and some of those decisions can be painful because we, you know, we have things to lose money. And but it changes their mindset. It changes the way they look at things. And so as a and as as an investor, I you know, I, I just love that mentality. I love having people win with me and lose with me. Yeah. Um, Can we talk about the investor table? Like someone bring, like I'm assuming you have a relationship with someone, they bring you a deal and you're presenting it to investment committee. Yes. What types of stuff are you talking about there? You're talking about risk, reward, returns. Um, So typically, um, so we'll bring a deal and we've, we've got, uh, we've got some criteria that is kind of, um, key criteria that we look at every time. Um, one of the things we look at is, hey, is this in our wheelhouse? Is there, can we add value to this? Is this something that um, we know and if something goes bad, can we jump in and help? So knowing it is, is and, and being comfortable is probably number one. How do you add value? Like what's, where, what's an example of a company that you're like, we can add a lot of value to this because of our, is it your expertise or your balance sheet or what, how does that work? Good question. Really good question. Um, I think there's a lot of ways to add value and, and I'll give you, I'll give you an example. And this is, this is just one, one way, but, um, I think you can add value by bringing people an opportunity that they couldn't access with, without you or without that situation you can de-risk something. So you can take an opportunity and then you can somehow pull risk out of it. Um, You can provide them um, capital. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these operating companies 
great companies, but they just don't have access to capital. So by us bringing capital in, it, it's a, it, it adds value. And I told you I'd give you an example of one of those. Um, so we invested in 2021 in a company out of uh, Boise, Idaho, um, Tricidio Homes. Yep. And um, John Hastings is the founder and CEO, and he, you know he's really a student of home building. And he just gets in, he loves the details, he learns them, he understands why. And for him, you look and you say, okay, this guy, he understands the business, he understands the industry. Yeah, we have experience build, with home building companies, but... Just you a know, little, just a yeah, little experience. How yeah. are we going to, you know, what, what can we do that really adds value to him? So um, a lot of small home builders... And when I say small, you know, somebody that's doing under 500 homes a year. Tiny, uh, tiny home yeah, builders. Yeah, yeah. They are, uh, the banks are requiring the, the principals and founders to guarantee everything. Mm -hmm. And so if you hit a recession like 2008, everybody remembers 2008. Um, it could wipe them out. And all of their life's work is on the line. And so one of the things we did with John, and I remember we took him fishing in Alaska. And um, I love Alaska, just so you know. Like, oh, if you ever want to take me, let me know. So. It's beautiful. And it, and and Mark would always say, "Hey, if you're closing a deal, you got to go. You got to go sweet talk him. You got to, of course, uh, wine him and dine him." And and so we thought, well, what would John want? And so we said, let's take him to Alaska fishing. And so we took a week long trip up there and. And that was in 2020, and he wouldn't do the deal. And, but we talked a lot about the deal. And the thing that we brought to the deal that de-risked it, the added value to John was we said, hey, listen, we're going to go get your guarantees off all the debt. So you're going to walk out after our deal's done, and everything you have outside the business, that is all yours. And it's not going to go back into the business. And so for him, it was like, okay, I've been doing this for 12, 13 years and every day feeling like my life's on the line. All. Yeah. Right. And is that like you're shifting the recourse to Blue Diamond or is it like we have such a big balance sheet that we can get non-recourse loans? Or how does how's that work? Yeah, good question. Um, a lot of it was um, because of our relationships with the banks and their experience with us. Um, because of the other home building companies we'd been involved in, they saw this track record. They saw, okay, these guys are, you know, they're, they're conservative investors. They have a, a balance sheet. They can put capital into the business. But beyond that, they run things the right way. And they don't over leverage. Um, they, you know, they build transparency so we can understand their business and, uh, and so with the relationships we had on the banking side, we said, hey, we're going to do this deal. We're going to put money. We're going to inject money into this business for growth. But as lenders to this business, what we want you to do is go non-recourse. Mm -hmm. And so we signed the deal, got the deal done, and all the banks went non-recourse. That's fantastic. Yeah. So how do you um, – this is a question I wanted to ask you. Yeah. You mentioned you guys don't get over leveraged, but with those lines of credits – I've got to assume that you're just drawing the max that you can on it, right? Or how do you do those deals? Like I bring you, I bring Tricidio 200 acres. Like, are they just extending one of those lines of credit out to buy that? Or is it, is there still cash? How does that work? Yeah. Um, so what we will, what we'll typically do is we'll operate within a, within a set leverage amount. Okay. Um, uh, with, with, our first home building company, which was Edge. Shout out Our, Edge. Yeah, Edge. yeah. Yeah. Great people. Great people. Um, our leverage when we first started that was probably ridiculous. I mean, it was probably five to one or six to one. You know, it was, it was, but what we've done is we've said, hey, um, we've, to work with the banks and have a relationship with the banks, what leverage levels do we have to keep these businesses at? And so we're very disciplined on um, managing the leverage down to, to agreed upon levels. 
we've had with the banks and um and we just don't go beyond that and there's been times where we look at the growth of the company and we say wow this company can continue to grow is there a way that we can continue to grow it without increasing the leverage and and in those situations we've um put additional dollars uh, but we do a a mes debt type structure mm. where we're putting in debt. We're not diluting our founders because they've done a great job in growing the business. They put us in a great situation where we had growth on the the equity side, and so we want to still want to get a rate of return on that on those dollars we're putting in, but we don't want to dilute them. And and so then the banks allow us to count that as equity, which allows us to get additional. Uh, debt to grow. And when you said like five turns, six turns of leverage, what does that mean compared to like a real estate? I look at, you know, an LTV or an LTC. Um, How does that compare? Yeah. So um, on a, on a five turns, if you had a hundred million in equity, you could have up to 500 million to debt. Now (laughs) we don't operate our home building companies anywhere close to that. Yeah. And, and really when we started edge, it was really a sign of the times where we were going to banks, we were moving inventory for banks. And so we were saying, Hey, um, we're going to buy your lot. You want to sell it for 40,000. Everybody's offering you 20,000. We'll give it, we'll pay you 30,000, but here's the deal. You, you got to finance it. Hmm. And, and so, um, that's why our leverage with edge was so much higher is just because it was a sign of the times. And, and, and as we got profits, we delevered that business and, um, significantly brought the leverage down. And, and, you know, I would say, you know, the home building companies we operate now, we're probably in a one, 1. 1.5 to two O debt to equity ratio. So, to put it in a percentage, a two to one means you have 66% of your uh, capital stack as debt and 33% or 33.33% yep. as equity. And does that change, like, because one thing that's interesting about you guys is you're more, I almost look at you as more of like a private equity company than like a family office. Because yeah. you, um, you'll buy these companies or invest in these companies and then you'll have like a seven-year horizon with them and then you'll sell them right do you it sounds like you throttle down the debt before the exit or how does does that change a little bit um you know it 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 depends on what the company needs for growth um it's we will throttle down the debt if um we don't need the debt for growth Mm -hmm. um and um you know the what we try to do is we, we want any, any investment we make to be, we don't necessarily look at it as our last investment, but we want it to be a, a one and done. We want to put capital in and then grow it. And if we need earnings to, to be retained, let's retain earnings and allow earnings to help us grow that. And, um, and so depending on how successful you are, sometimes the, you know, the debt, if you're, if you're retaining more earnings than your growth, then your debt will naturally decrease. It's not, I wouldn't say it's strategic. What we want to do is we want to, we want our, our financing structure to be market. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you look at home building companies, um, you look at the largest public home building companies, they have a pittance of debt. I mean, yeah, it's insane. There's nothing. Yeah. Now they move it all off balance sheet with, um, JVs and other things, which, which we don't necessarily have in place, mm-hmm. but we're working on. And so, uh, we, we try to move to market for, for what our companies are. And, and so that means debt, depending on the economy, debt can flow up or down. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> do you, do you study like DR Horton and Lennar and see how they're doing stuff and like shift your business plan in accordance to them or do you feel like they do it differently than you would? Like, how do you look um, at those guys? Yeah, I mean, I think we want to learn from those guys. I mean, the, the, those guys are the big dogs. Um, 
they do 80,000 homes a year for a reason. Yeah. Um, I don't think, I think what we have to do is you've got to understand your game plan and how it's different from theirs. Um, they run, they've, it's, it's been interesting because before the great recession, um, they were very, those, the builders were much more cyclical and home building is cyclical, but, um, they ran their business as cyclical entities. Now they really look at their businesses as, um, we're, we're manufacturing. We're trying to, to drive totally. manufacturing efficiencies. And that means if at times we need to shrink our margins to keep our... our Your volumes up yeah, or something. Yeah. Then we're going to do that. And um, when you have very little debt, it's easy to do that. Yeah. And, and so what we have to do is we have to look and say, how do we compete against them? We can't exactly be like them because we don't have their capital stacks and um, we don't necessarily even have their name brand. So we have to say, how do we pivot against them? How do we, how do we, if their strategy is X, how do we do Y and compete? How do you do that? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I will say there's a couple of ways. Um, w- one of the things that I learned early on from Mark, um, was a strategy he implemented in his business in phone directories. Um, he started the company back in 71. And when I say phone directories, most people are like, what is he even talking about? Yeah. And, uh, but he, when he started that business, there were other groups in the industry and he was fairly early in the industry. Um, but everybody was fighting over New York and LA because they had these huge population counts and huge print numbers. And he built his business in places like Jackson Hole and St. George and, you know, Colorado Springs. And they were they were kind of these secondary markets where he found that the competition wasn't there. And if he went in and he provided a good quality product, he could dominate. And if you look at, at some of our companies, some are investing, um, you know, when we got involved and we were doing Edge, there really wasn't that many publics here in Utah building. Yeah, there was like nobody. Yeah, and uh, Ivory was the 800-pound gorilla, and they're still the big boys, although they're not the biggest. And um, and so it allowed you it allows you to grow the company. And not necessarily get crushed by the 800 pound gorilla. And so, if you look at some of the other companies, we got involved in Boise again. There weren't that many publics. Um, Toll Brothers was really the only public in the Boise market when we went up there. I feel like they have a different business model, right? They do. They do. And Toll is not like Dear <coughs> Horton or Lennar. And, and so, if you part of the strategy was, um, go find where we can compete and uh, build build in a market that maybe isn't as competitive, but follow good business principles. Go, go follow the fundamentals. And, um, and then once you get scale, you get a certain scale in a market, you can compete with anybody. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, we kind of took a long detour yeah. back from uh, the investor table. So yeah. sorry, I get selfish with some of these questions. So we'll go back to the investor table. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so you're looking at deals that you can add value to, deals that are in yes. your strike zone. Um, do you have like a minimum? You're like, like if I said, here's a guaranteed 8% or 10%, yeah. you're like, it's too low or anything like that. Like, how do those conversations go? Yeah, good question. Um, so back in in investment committee, can we add value? Number one, management team. That's that is like high on the list. Number two, have they been there? Have done that? You know, are they are they the right people? Um, do does their vision align with our vision? Right. If this is if this is just a pump and dump, that's their vision, probably doesn't align with what we're trying to do. Yeah. 
Um, and so um, on the on the returns, we do look at risk adjusted rate of return. So um, we'll look at a deal and you know, there there may be deals that are getting us eight to ten percent, but they ha it, it has high liquidity, it has um, low risk associated with it. Um, and we'll say, hey, we need an allocation towards that because of our timing, maybe that fits perfectly. Um, whereas some of our operating companies, um, you know, we're going to have to get above a 20% rate of return, 20% IRR, mm -hmm. just because operating companies can go to zero and the risk associated with them, um, we need to get a higher, high enough rate of return um, that we're comfortable with the risk. So we, we will look at risk-adjusted rates of return. And that's why maybe real estate fits really well is, is real estate is, it has a little more risk than fixed income, but it gets higher rates of return. Has less risk than your typ typical PE or operating company but it gets a lower rate of return. I feel like you guys have histor historically done, is it almost exclusively exclusively development or have you done some value add stuff as well? Uh, we've done a lot of development. Um, we've done a little bit of value add. Is there a um, reason for that? Um, some of it's timing, some of it's timing. I, uh, you know, I was fortunate we sold uh, the Yellow Page company in July of 2007. And uh, uh, I always tell people uh, we got liquidity right before the world's largest garage sale happened. Yeah. And, uh, you know, 2000, it didn't happen in 08, and it didn't really happen in 09, but at the end of 09, 10, 11, 12, it was like every financial institution had their goods out on their yard ready to take deals. Yeah. And... Um, and, and so what happened is because you had riskier assets uh, being considered development, being discounted heavier than in-place cash flows, there was better opportunities. And so we ended up out of the gate, we ended up doing a lot more development just because there was a, the opportunities, the risk-adjusted opportunities were we're so much better. Um, the last couple of years, we've had to kind of pivot that a little bit. And it's it's not so much um, new development, but it's more of a, okay, let's do a value add. Let's, let's buy something and convert it. Or let's um, maybe not even invest in an, in, the real property, but put in leasehold improvements mm. and do arbitrage off of rent. Interesting. Um, so um, I think whether you do development or whether you do uh, value add, purchase, renovate, so a lot of that's going to be driven by the market. Okay. Um, so you've invested in a variety of companies, yeah. which I think is so cool. Um so I want to talk about a, a couple of them, uh, okay. one of them being Rimrock. And yes. I would eventually love to buy, I'll, I'll give you my pitch here. Okay. I'd love to buy a construction company eventually. Like I think I have, you know, a decent following and I think I can dread, I think I can add value to that type of business. Like I'm doing my own projects. Yeah. I know other developers. Would you talk me out of doing that? Um, you know, it, it Again, my kids Only are going to hate questions. this answer. Yeah. They're going to hate this answer. It depends. I, not necessarily. I think um, uh, when we got involved with Rimrock, one of the things we saw that that was attractive is at that point in time, um, we were doing a fair amount of development. And we thought, gosh, this is – this is a point in time in the market where um, uh, we're going to be driving business to this company. And so we're going to be able to drive growth in this business 
absent anything else in the market. And, um, and they were coming, it was 2009. And so they were coming off of the, the, the slide that happened with the great, great, uh, recession. And, um, and so it ended up being a great partnership in that when things were, were relatively light as far as volume, the two main financial partners in it, both were doing development. And both could uh, subsidize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when things became really frothy, at that point, I'm like, "Hey, you, you go bid or go work on everybody anybody's work. I'm gonna go bid mine. I'll bid it to you. I'll bid it to everybody else." And and you know, one of the philosophies we have is when we invest in a company, we want them all to stand on their own. Mm-hmm. I don't, I, I don't want sweetheart deals. Meaning. If I own Rimrock, they're going to charge me market rate. Um, and if Cornerstone Concrete's doing the concrete for Rimrock, who's doing it for you? Yeah, yeah, they're going to charge market rate, and and um, and that way they don't get fat and happy. They're competitive, um, but I still have influence there. So if they're bidding my job and another job, and the, the amount of profits the same. If I can get it cheaper from another contractor and I feel like the quality is there, I may go to that other contractor. But if if not, and if if my company's bidding it um, and all everything else is equal, I'm going to definitely give it to my own company and 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 grow it. So would I would I advise you to buy a, a construction company if you're going to be doing a fair amount of construction? I would say. If you have a passion for the construction company and if you have the right management team that are partnering with you, unless you want to be that that management team. I don't think I could. So I think this goes into a different question. Okay. Let's say someone owns a construction company and they're like, I want that guy to invest in my construction company. Yeah. What should I look for? Is it like, do I need to look for an established management team or could I invest in two guys in a pickup truck? Yeah. Um, I would say the upside in two guys in a pickup truck is probably higher, meaning they're probably going to value their business at the cost of that pickup truck and the two <laughs> shovels. Yeah. So you can get in really cheap. Yep. Um, uh, but there's, there's more risk because they've got to build their name. They've got to build their reputation. And, um, if you've got enough capital that they can build it off of you. Okay, great. Maybe that's a really good opportunity. Um, but if they've got to do third-party work, having somebody that has relationships, more established, has a reputation, um, that may be the better long-term bet. And okay. for us, you know, we, we always have the opportunity to, to go in and do startups. And you asked me in uh, kind of preparing this, startups versus established, and and um, there's groups, and it goes back to the discussion of VC versus uh, private equity is, you know, some people love the startups. For us and me and our group, we're typically a little more risk averse, so we, we're, gonna, we're gonna go with a little more of a known quantity, which probably will limit our upside a little bit, but, it, it also creates more stability in the investment. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> back to like the cornerstone working for Rimrock, working yeah. for PEG. Yeah. I feel like you could do that with like basically every trade out there. Like you could buy a plumber, yes. keep them busy with like four different companies that you have. Is there a reason that you haven't done that? You just haven't found the right operator? Um, it's a good question. You could be um, the king of the trades if you wanted. You could have yeah. every single one if you want. It's been interesting. We've had opportunities to invest in other trades. And some of the deals we haven't done, it's because of the management team. We looked at them and we said, okay, if we went in and blew them up, would they be would, would that management team that's in place be able to grow with the company? Would they be able to support it or or is is this um is this just a train wreck 
waiting to happen. Is that what you tell them? It's, no, it's like, of course not. <laughs> I was of course say, not. Of course like, not. We like this business. We just hate you. So we no, can't yeah, no, and it, and 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 sometimes it's not. You know, there's people, and and I think everybody. I would say, when I look at at careers and I look at people's journey uh, as they go through life as it relates to work and what they do, their passions, that everybody has a place. You have to figure out what your place is. And there are entrepreneurs who get in their business and they grow it to a certain size and they're completely comfortable with it. And they mm-hmm. don't, they don't want to change it. They don't, they, it, they're very comfortable. And that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. But then as an investor, if I look at that and I say, okay, you're completely comfortable doing what you're doing. Where's my upside? Right, yeah. exactly. It, and it, there's just not an opportunity. And so I would, it's kind of interesting on a side note, one of the hottest investments in the PE right now, HBAC. subcontractors. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're trading for like, I remember at the peak I saw an HVAC contractor trade for like 17X on, on EBITDA. And yeah. I was like, Oh man, I think we hit the top. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, that's for crazy. sure. That's it crazy. It is. It is. And so it's it's you know there's opportunity in whatever business line of business you want to be in. Is there? You guys have a pretty diverse portfolio. Is there any se- sector that you want to enter or want to get more involved in? Um. So one of the things we've talked about is, um, you know, real estate's really struggled the last couple of years. What? Yeah. So, Surprise. I know. Breaking news. Uh, you know, the worst kept secret. Yeah. Um, and so we've looked for opportunities with good operating companies. Um, it, that's been tricky. It, I mean, we've had everything from a... a mental health facilities <laughs> to uh, uh, arcade like fun centers um, you know we it, it, it's amazing that just the, the, the deals ecosystem we see. Yeah, yeah for sure and I, and I will tell you sometimes I ask myself I'm like okay you're in meeting with me you're in this line the best investors in this line are A, B, and C, and yet you're here. That means A, B, and C said no for some reason. Either, you know, what's the reason? Either I'm, there's something I'm not seeing here, or, yeah. or you know. And so I have to ask myself that sometimes when we get these deals. But, um yeah, I, I think if we found some some great operating companies, we'd look at them. We've had deals in food services. We're just not – food isn't our, our thing. And in, even in our operating companies, we've tried to say, is there a real estate angle so that maybe we can give us synergies associated with our other business? So I want to talk about uh, this – could either be a good or a bad segue. Um, okay. One of your non real estate deals okay. was a sportsman's warehouse. Yes. And I just found out that the guy who started sportsman's warehouse lives like a block away from me. Just okay. Him. So yeah. Super yeah. nice guy. Um, but he sold in like 99 and you guys bought him out of bankruptcy. Tell me this story. So um, I will tell you sportsman's warehouse. I mean, it, it is a legend of Blue Diamond um, for good and bad. <laughs> um, it is our highest multiple deal. Oh, ever. nice. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, it was, so I don't know if your neighbor is Stu Utgard or, no. or not, but the guy that started it sold it to Stu, and Stu was a, Stu, it, a very intelligent individual, um, very talented. He I don't know if he was an investment banker or a business broker, but he'd take businesses and sell them. And and he saw this business and he's like, I want this business. I can grow this business. And, and so he took over and started growing the business. And because of Mark's um, 
relationships in outdoors. Yeah. He uh, knew Stu. Mm -hmm. And so Stu was growing. And so initially we started lending Stu money. He would. He for would the come. business. Yeah. And, and Stu's goal was um, grow, 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 grow. And he was opening up new locations and, I mean, he was expanding the business pretty rapidly and and needed capital for inventory. And and so we initially w were lending Stu money. And then it got to the point where uh, Stu needed a number that was much bigger than what I was comfortable with. And so we had developed some relationships in the, in the PE world. And uh, I called up... Uh, Bob Seidler or Christie's, I can't remember which, from Seidler Equity. And I said, hey, here's a deal for you guys. Um, and we made the introduction. And um, and they gave him, I, I think at one point they had $80 million oh, in the business. Whoa. Yeah. And because of that, we, we, and for Seidler, out of the gates, when they put the money in, it was a great deal for them. They were making good money, and Stu was making good money. So, was it like inventory financing then? So, like it was, was a, almost a revolver or a revolving line of credit. Yeah, that, they put it in as equity dollars, okay. and then because you have equity, you yeah. have additional equity, you can go to lenders, and yep. lenders will say, "Hey, okay, we'll give you additional leverage." And um, he was developing a lot of sites, but then I think he'd turn around with a lot of these sites and sell them off. So his big cash need was inventory. Mm -hmm. And and it would, any retailer, they're very lumpy business towards the end of the year. And um, and so anyway, the so that deal was a victim of, uh, you know, it was a victim of the Great Recession. And he had grown his business, and he was still growing, but he had had high leverage right at the wrong time. Was that like a banking thing that went bad, or was it like consumer spending was so low that, or a combination of both of them? Uh, it was basically a domino impact of the two. It was consumers slowed down their spending, and they were still growing, and because they had other sites they had to fill, and and all of a sudden, the lender said, hey, we're not going to give you additional dollars. And yeah. Jeez. So, um, so it was interesting. We, we um, so the, the business at that point, our loan dollars had been paid out. And we didn't have any dollars left in the business. And the business goes into bankruptcy. And, and it was going to be restructured. And we had, I got two phone calls, one from Seidler's and one from Stu. Yeah. And uh, it was really interesting because both were, both needed about the same dollar amount. They had, I don't know if they, if one had put the bankruptcy plan together and the other just copied or if they <laughs> independently come yeah. to the same number. And, you know, both were very sophisticated, so probably no doubt they both came to the same number and they came to us and it was interesting. I had a conversation with Stu and I said, Stu, okay, we can do this. We can put the money in. Uh, but listen, it, and, and here's the one difference. Let me go into the difference before I get into a little bit more detail is um, Stu didn't have capital. Mm -hmm. So he came to us and he wanted the entire amount. And Seidler's came to us and they said, hey, we're going to put in the majority. Do you guys want to piggyback? You introduced us to these guys. Do you want to piggyback? And um, and so I had a conversation with Stu and I said, hey, Stu, we have the money. We can put the money in. But I want you to understand when we put the money in, this is our business. That means that if we give you advice you gotta listen this isn't it's not advice it's you're doing what yeah. yeah and and i said one of the first things you got to do is you got to get rid of that jet <laughs> i'm dead serious oh, i mean man. the company goes into bankruptcy and it's got a jet and i'm like you know you Stu, you gotta fly commercial <laughs> and he uh, hung up on me he hung no up way. on me yeah 
And um, and it was like, okay, I know how he views us. Yeah. And so we ended up doing the 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 deal with with Seidler, and you know, in hindsight, the plan was the plan that was put together was amazing. I mean, we had ninety stores. Um, a third of them, you we voided the lease and just shut down. A third of them got sold off to another retailer, and the cream, the the third that was the most profitable stores, we got to keep. And in any growing business, you have these aspects of your business that are highly profitable that are subsidizing the growing parts of your business that are mm -hmm. just chewing up cash. And we got to push all the stuff that was chewing up cash off. And, uh, and it was an incredible investment. And, and, you know, I'd love to take credit for the brains. We, we were just capital on that. It, Seidler was the brains behind it. And, um, and the big to do in our office was we had an opportunity to put in a certain amount and they said you can put in this range and mark and i had a debate mark's like let's put in the max <laughs> and i'm like no we're gonna put in half that yeah and so you you, you know every time we talk about it mark reminds me we could have doubled our money <laughs> <laughs> of course so. of course okay um that's a crazy story i can't believe i've never heard that before yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it was fun. Okay. Um, so you guys have exited every business that you've been a part of, is that, or almost every, or how does that, how do you think about the exit strategies yeah. when you invest? Um, we've exited, we've exited a fair amount. Um, and I would say every exit is different. Um, and, and part of that is because of who we are. If we were a true PE that's probably the biggest difference between us and a PE fund is a PE fund is going to have a five to seven year timeline. They're, They're going to pull the capital yeah, in. Buy it, fix it, sell it, basically. Exactly. And um, that's what I love about a, working with a family is our timelines can be the family's timelines. Mm -hmm. And that means we can hold stuff for extremely long times. Uh, we just sold an asset last year that we had for 14 years Is that um, a real estate asset yeah mm -hmm. um and so that allows us to be flexible on the holding and a lot of times especially with these operating companies we'll get in with the with the operators or the founders and we'll say your our goal is your goal because our we're looking for our foundation where these funds are flowing to be perpetual. We want them to last forever, be beyond long beyond when I'm going to be around. And so I can match your timeline as a founder. And if, you know, the, if you're a founder in your mid thirties and you're like, gosh, I want to do this till I'm 50 or 55. I'm like, okay, great. Let's do mm -hmm. it. And that's something you'll never go to a PE fund. Yeah. No way. And so that's an advantage. But I would say, you know, unlike family offices, we can be entrepreneurial. Most family offices wouldn't go in in a, in a GP or a sponsor position like we would. They just don't want to take that kind of risk. And, and because we've got this entrepreneurial founder and Mark, he's like, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so – you have exited the home building companies, is it? We have exited. Uh, we've two exited. Of we've had a full exit on one. Yep. And we've had a partial exit on uh, a second home building company. So why why sell those two? Um. This might be it, an emotional story. Oh, so. it, you know, it, it it is. It is. Part of it is, yeah. I mean, edge. Um, Edge was one of our great, one of our early success stories. Oh, lights just turned off. One second. No problem. So, there we go. Means we're not moving around enough. We need exactly. to be more interactive. I need to be flaying, flailing yeah, my arms. I'm working on that for the YouTube <laughs> videos. Um, uh, so let's actually let's actually step back and hear the yeah. story the story of Edge from your perspective because we've had Steve Maddox on the show and yeah. we had Mark on the show. Um, so how did that relationship start from your perspective? 
Um, so the, the edge story actually goes back to one of our failures. Um, we, uh, back when we were still in the phone directories company, we had some excess cash come out of the business and we were looking to diversify, put the money someplace else. And, and, uh, we had a group bring us a subdivision. Oh, I love this story. I'm glad you brought yeah. this up. Yeah. Um, and it, it was in Heber city. Mm -hmm. and, and this was before Heber became like billionaires. Row, right. So. Right. Right. And, um, we bought a three phase project for $8 million. And, uh, the group that brought it with us said, Hey, we're going to help you. We're going to do the development. We're going to do this and that. And, and so we went and got a loan for that first phase and we put $4 million into that first phase. And we finished with that first phase. And within six weeks, we had sold that first phase for $10 million. It's pretty so, good. Yeah. So yeah. we put eight for all the phases of land, four for the improvements, including offsite. So we're in at 12. So we sell for 10. We have 2 million net. And I'm thinking, wow. I am really smart. <laughs> this is really good. This is easy. I can yeah. do this. I yeah. mean, those land, what are those guys talking about? How hard this is. Yeah. And, um, and so what do we do? We, um, we end up buying another parcel of land from a couple of guys that were building homes, which clue, if you're buying subdivisions from people that make money, building in subdivisions, then you got to ask yourself why. You double check, yeah. Yeah. And uh, and in that group was the, the two individuals were Gordy Jones and Joel Harris. Mm -hmm. And at that point, they they were, they had transitioned from G&J Homes or Highland Homes, and they had just started this new company, um, Edge Homes, and, and they were, um, selling that subdivision. So we had the one in Heber. We picked this other other one up in Spanish Fork. And um, and one of the groups that bought that first phase in Heber gave us an LOI um, for $25 million. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. And all we have to do is do the improvements on phase two and three. And um, and that was going to be another $3 million. And so I looked at that and I said, okay, we're going to make $20 million on this deal in two years. I mean, this is easy. And, and so we proceeded with the improvements. And, you know, one of the things I learned early on, I remember the, the gentleman, it was a public home builder. And it was one of the largest public home builders in Utah. And the gentleman, um, they had acquired another builder in the state. And, and they, he gave me this LOI. And so we go through, we put debt on it to, to do that next phase of improvements. And we finished with that, those improvements in May of 07. And so here I go to collect on my LOI. And, you know, the learning was I should have put this thing into a purchase agreement, you know, just elementary real estate stuff that being new in real estate, it was like, it was just maybe details I missed. Yeah. And uh, I remember the guy said, son, that LOI isn't worth the paper it's written on. You want to just sock him in the face right oh, there? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I was so mad, and, and you know, of course, the rumblings beginning of '07. Everybody knows things are slowing down, and and we looked at what had happened in the first two phases, and we realized in Heber City we've improved more lots than have been than building permits have been pulled in the preceding five years. Man, I feel like I get a deal like that like once every six weeks. Someone will yeah. send me like, "Hey." you should do this deal in the middle of nowhere. You can build a thousand, $1 million homes. I'm like, there are 400 people here. Like, right. I can't do right. that. Right. So, right. And so what, what did you do after you were like, 
Oh no. So um, it took time. It, it so in the midst of all of that, our bank who had lent us money got taken over by the FDIC, and so now I'm dealing with FDIC regulators. And you know we'd had a lot of conversations with the loan officer and. The, the bank, we had a good relationship with the bank. We had met with the board of directors, good relationship with them. And they're like, oh, yeah, we're going to extend this loan. Don't worry. And then all of a sudden the FDIC takes it over. And the FDIC is like, I don't care what you had with them. We're not. And I'm assuming this is like summer of 07. Or so the FDIC, I think that it's either 08 or 09 at that point. So time had elapsed. Yep. And, and you had sold the phone directories. Company. Yeah, so we sold some. phone directories in 07. And, and um, you know, we had liquidity. Yeah. But we were deploying liquidity in other deals. And, and um, you know, and that, I think that's one of the lessons you, you asked me early on. If you had a big liquidity event, what would you do to start a family office? Probably the first thing I'd do. And our investment banker gave us this advice. He said, Put the money in account and don't do anything for six months. It's sage advice. Yeah. Right there. Oh, come and and we didn't do that necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, Mark being entrepreneurial, there was like deals all the time and yeah, it was in in heaven, right? right. And so, um, so we had in 07, we we went about just deploying the, the money as quickly as possible to get returns and. I would have been, you know, in hindsight, I would have been more deliberate, mm -hmm. uh, not as opportunistic, more deliberate. And I would have still made some of the great bets we made, but I also would have avoided some of the dogs yeah. that we invested in. Yeah, but that's, um, I, had, I had an old boss who used to say, like, experience is what comes from when you're expecting to make money and you don't. Yes. So that's experience. And I, I totally agree with that. I think that I you learn more from when things go bad. 100%. And that's why I even look at like this time in the real estate industry. This is when people, this is when the next gen is made. Mm -hmm. If you can go out, you can find solutions. You can push through. You can do great projects. You can, you know, solve issues today. It's easy when things are going great. Mm -hmm. It's when it's hard that solving problems make a difference. I gotta say, personally for me, like I'm the timing has been kind of frustrating. Like I feel like I'm right about to hit the, you know, rocket ship of my career and then rates start yeah. climbing. But I have to imagine if I would have started my career like three, four years earlier, I would be hating my life right now. Cause yeah. I didn't I'd never seen that before. Yeah. So, yeah. Um so back to the edge homes. So yeah. working through the FDIC. So we worked through the FDIC, um, you know, it, I, it, there's a whole other saga on that. Um, and, but we end up retaining control of the lots and, and we worked a deal with that, with the FDIC and, and um, we didn't pay it off. Oh, what? We still had the loan. Um, but the thing we realized is 09, 10, we couldn't. We couldn't give a lot away, like I, nobody would take a lot. I mean, it was just it was it was. Yeah, I had, have a mentor who uh, started a home building company, and he told me that he the way he got through the recession was selling lots to other home builders. Yeah, and it was lots that he had been foreclosed on, and so mm. he just spent seventy five thousand dollars improving this lot. Yeah, and now he's selling it to someone else for like five thousand dollars. Yeah, it was just no one would buy it. Right. And if you had no money, like all these groups, all their liquidity just vanished. Right. So. Right. Yeah. And it was, it was, you know, it was the same way. And, and the other thing was when we, when we sold phone directories, we got in real estate. Um, we had a lot of, you know, real estate is, is debt heavy. I mean, it's, you usually have more debt than you have equity. And, and all the banks were like, okay, who are you guys? <laughs> We don't know who you guys are. You're in the media industry. You had yeah. no debt in the media industry. And so it was hard finding people who would believe in us. And um, and so 
we couldn't give lots away. And prior to the Great Recession, uh, Gordy Jones had approached me and he said, hey, why don't you invest in us? How did that relationship get started? We bought the, the, oh, okay. the yeah. subdivision yep. Spanish Fork from Oh, okay. Yep. And, um, and so we were working on potentially a deal in 07. And, um, and Mark killed the deal. He got, he got really nervous, and it was the right call. He made the right call. He killed the deal in 07. And it was the right call because if we had done the deal with Edge, now the banks would have said, okay, you've got this home building company. They've got all of these loans when these assets that are problematic, but you've got this guy that has capital. He's going to infuse that. You're going to pay off the loans. Mm -hmm. And instead, they didn't get that easy out. Ah. What, what Gordy and Joel had to do is they had to go solve their other problems. They had to fix what was wrong, and they came out of it cleaner. Mm. And, um, and so we kept the conversation alive. But in 2010, we started buying, you know, in, in 9, 10, we started saying, hey, we can't give lots away. Let's build on it. And we actually worked with three different builders in the two subdivisions to build homes. We just said, hey, we're going to finance this. We'll get financing. Don't worry about it. Um, and, but you build and sell. And, um, and we ended up, those guys could sell. Um, and, you know, they had, they had teamed up with Dean Ingram and, and Steve Maddox on the selling side, and they could sell and they could move product. And we saw that. And they went from, so Edge, in 2009, before we got involved, sold two homes. <laughs> they closed two homes. Oh, man. And they were in November of nine. Yeah. And, and Joel Harris was sitting in the model, and he would sketch on onion skin paper and sell them. But, but um, in 2010, when we partnered with him and said, you build, we'll finance these, they went from two to 106. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, and it's kind of just up and to the right from there, right? The, yeah. Like the following I mean, it years, just, it was just, you're still buying just huge kept, discounts. It was like doubling every year. Yeah. So why... You sold it in 2017, is that right? We did, yeah. And what what made you say, I, we're going to exit this? Um, good question. It was, it was, um, so there was really mixed feelings at Blue Diamond about it. And, uh, and uh, it was, it, you know, Mark said that he and I have only had one disagreement, and it was all over Edge. Yeah. Um, he doesn't ever tell which disagreement it was, but it was over <laughs> Edge. And I still remember a heated board meeting. And, and the thing I love about kind of Mark and Debbie and their philosophy is they understand business can get stressful at times. And, and the comment early on, and I even witnessed this at their phone directories, is, in the boarding room, it's okay to show some emotion. It's okay to express your feelings. And, but you walk out the door, you walk out united, and you do yep. what, what you agree to do. And um, I remember a heated board meeting, and um, there had been some discussions, and, and Mark's like, we're going to sell this. We're going to sell this. And I said to him, and I pointed to him, and I said, I will sell your ownership and I'll make sure you get top dollar, and I'll do this, but I'm not selling mine. What What made you say that? Was it like you thought there was still value to be had, or you yeah. just luck, like you loved working with these guys, or what? Yeah, what I, the... I thought there was still value to be had, and um, I enjoyed some of the relationships. And, um, you know, there were talented individuals there. And... Um, and I, you know, I saw that there was still upside. And, uh, and there was, I mean, they, you know, in hindsight, 
if we'd held on to it, the net income they made in the next two years was equal to what we got out of the cell. <laughs> so, yeah. But that being said, if we'd not done that deal, we wouldn't have developed some of the relationships and we wouldn't have done some of the deals that we did afterwards. And I will tell you that some of those relationships are probably my most cherished relationships in the business community. And so what I would say is that, you know, life is more than just about money. Yep. Um, and for me, you know, I, I believe there's a divine purpose. I believe there's a reason that I was connected with Mark um, and Debbie. And that's given me incredible opportunities. In fact, I believe that I was prompted to do that to when I had the opportunity to start working with him. And I, I am grateful that um, – I'm grateful for the opportunities I've had. There's been opportunities to make more money. Um, but I wouldn't change what I've learned along the way. I wouldn't change the mistakes that have helped me make who I am. And, uh, and that sale led to different opportunities with different relationships with people that are important to me today. And so I'm grateful. So I want to bring this home on kind of where you see the future of Blue Diamond Capital. Like, is yeah. it you're just going to keep rinsing and repeating on what you're doing? Like, you'll buy a home builder every couple of years, maybe some opportunistic operating companies, the occasional real estate deal. What do you see the next 5, 10, 20, 30, 40, however you want to? Yeah. Um, well, I think because of the generosity of Mark and Debbie and – them saying, hey, all this is going into a foundation. It's going to be perpetual. I think there's going to be opportunities for people with Blue Diamond for a long time. And what we've done over the last several numbers of, of years is as we've done deals, we've generated kind of a following of people who have had success with us and, and will go in and do deals with us. And we've had other families come aboard and we're actually serving other families and helping them with everything from investing to philanthropy to dealing with family issues. And, and, um, and I would say, you know, for me, when I look at Blue Diamond, um, I, Blue Diamond is, is much bigger than me. Um, I'm grateful that I've been a part of its creation and growth. But then I look at, you know, I look at the next gen and, and um, you know, we've got talented people like Michael McKay and Brandon Ball. No particular order. Yeah, of course. But those are, those are, those are um, two key partners with me in Blue Diamond. And I really, you know, what I've expressed to them is you guys are going to be involved in this business longer than I am. Meaning, starting today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be done sooner than they are, mm -hmm. just because of age. And so I've said, what do you guys want it to be? And for me, that's how you get the best out of an organization, is if the key people involved in it are part of that decision on what it becomes. And, um, and we hope to bring in additional talent. We hope to bring in additional people that are going to help us continue to grow and set that vision. And so for me, Blue Diamond, uh, the vision of Blue Diamond is, is not just my vision, but it's this collective group's vision. And, and what do those guys want? What do they want it to become? How do they see it as their future opportunity? How do you balance, you know, they might have different opinions yeah. from you. And like if you're in charge and then this, next generation or next group of people they might think about something completely different than you for sure do you just provide uh wisdom or is it like no sorry we're gonna do it my way until you learn how the way i think like how how do those conversations go well if i had a corner on the market on knowledge and wisdom maybe i'd do that yeah but, 
I know that I don't. And I also know that people um, work harder for things they believe in and they have a passion about and that they're doing their way. And, um, you know, and I, I, uh, I'm going to talk about Brandon uh, a little bit just to maybe give some color to that question. Um, you know, Brandon's an incredibly talented guy. Um, I wouldn't be able to do what I do without him there. And he has a little bit of a different investing philosophy than me. And because he and I are the two main guys running the investments, um, sometimes those investments follow our personal interests or desires or interests. And I've encouraged that. I've, you know, for me, I want him to invest in things that he has a passion about, that he loves, that he grows. And if he does, he'll be successful. Because I find that people, if you have a passion for something, you're willing to put more into it mm -hmm. than the average everyday person. And, uh, and so that's how I think Blue Diamond on the investing side can evolve is um, whoever comes in and drives some of those investments, that next gen, their passion, their expertise will drive where some of that investing will go. Now, obviously, the families have to have a say, and it's yeah. got to follow their desires too. But if you can get a mix of alignment with a family and alignment with the in investor management, um, you know, you can have some incredibly things, incredible great things come out of that. So, so I, I guess maybe summarize i think blue diamond will blue diamond will be altered by the families and the investors that come and work with it but it'll also be altered by the in the investment managers mm -hmm. and how where they take it how does that work if i sold my nvidia stock yeah maybe it's only 50 million or something yeah, like yeah. that and i come to you do i just have unlimited say in deals that i'm like a part of or is it like hey we're investing your money into this deal you're gonna love it like we know what we're doing so good question um so what we try to do is we want to make sure that that there is um a congruency with what you want and what we want mm -hmm. so when we meet with families if we meet with a family and they're they and it's interesting because you get families that come out of the tech industry, and there's a lot of that here in Utah, yep. and they want to just do tech deals. And if you were, if you sold NVIDIA and you're you're a tech guy and you come to me and you you say, I want you to manage my family's money, and I'm a tech guy, I'm going to do tech deals, I'm going to say, we're not the best. Yeah, Go find somebody that, that that's their expertise. So so I think first we have to say, is, is there alignment between what – how you want to invest and how what our skills are set up investing and then if there is what we do with these families is we form investment committees okay and any deal we do the investment committee has to be unanimous oh wow yeah and the family gets represented on that investment committee and then we have a set of professionals that get invest that get represented on that investment committee do those get pretty heated if it's like i don't know are there like six seven people Right. So typically five people. Is it ever like four versus one and the four are like, we really need to do this deal and the other one's like, I have a bad feeling or something? Um, or is yeah. it a little more? Oh, yeah, definitely, for sure. Yeah, there's for sure that is. Um, for sure. And it you just, you don't do the deal. You don't deal the deal. and And you will miss out on great deals because of that. Do you rub it in their face? No, 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 I, no. I would. <laughs> yeah. But you will also miss yeah. out on terrible deals yeah. because of that. And that's where I would rub it in more probably. Yeah, like, yeah. You're welcome for not losing you all that money. Exactly. Um, is there like a lot of education you do? Like some tech company comes to you and they're like, I only want to do tech. And you're like, you need to learn about the fundamentals of real estate as well. So what I would say is um, people that have been successful 
and have a lot of money usually are very opinionated. <laughs> so <laughs> that's been my experience. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, you can, you can do a certain level of educating, but if people don't buy in, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to, I'm not going to be able to convince somebody that thinks tech is the only way to go that real estate's good. But I think what I would say is that, you know, general investment philosophy is you've got to have a diversified portfolio. Mm -hmm. That's like 101. Exactly. Investing 101. And, and so they come to that, they know that. And a lot of people know that real estate is a key alternate asset in that diversification. Yeah. There's a, there's a new Lamborghini parked outside of the gym that I go to. Yeah. And I was like, someone's about to learn about the fundamentals of industrial real estate today. So yes. I haven't found him <laughs> yet, but I'm going to find him and talk to him. So. All right. This was awesome. Yeah. Thanks, man. Oh, thank you. We'll this get is you. great. Come back whenever you want. This is fun. Okay. Yeah, so. anytime. Yeah. That was great. We covered so much stuff. <laughs>